My name is Marianne Tikkanen, and I want to welcome everybody here in this uh, webinar. Uh, good morning to those uh, who are joining in their morning, like we are from uh, Helsinki, Finland. Uh, and uh, good evening to those that are joining in, in your evening. Um, I am, uh, like many of you know, Puro Earth started uh, in 2019, uh, focused on engineered carbon removals uh, only. And I am really excited to be presenting a new member of the uh, Puro framework and, and family uh, woody biomass burial methodology. Uh, it is a combination of uh, technology and nature, so it has an engineering part, but also a nature part, like many, many of the existing ones. Uh, and it offers a great potential. That a work group has uh, elaborated the methodology, and now we are uh, open for uh, public uh, views and comments on that. Uh, how does it sit with the existing ones? So it is terrestrial, uh, just uh, like uh, so happening on land. Uh, it is starting from the atmosphere uh, through biomass, so photosynthesis is the uh, capture phase, and it is offering the 100 years um, permanence so uh, it sits uh, nicely and well in the uh, family of uh, puro uh, carbon removal methodologies. And now uh, back to the agenda. So we have uh, here today experts uh, uh, giving you presentations. First, an overview by uh, Leonard Smith from Puro, and then two projects uh, giving uh, practical examples of how could uh, woody biomass burial be done. And uh, in the end, we are open to questions uh, through the chat so that uh, we can have these uh, experts answer, answer your questions. And I will be uh, moderating and, and uh, picking the questions then uh, from the chat. Uh, so please, uh, Leonard, uh, guide us to the woody biomass burial methodology. Sure. Thank you, Marianne. Um, firstly, everyone can hear me Very loud and clear. Yes. OK. All right. Well, thank you all for joining. Um, let's press on. OK, so I'm going to take you through, as Marianne spoke about, um, an overview I guess more technically and from our uh, particular uh, methodological standpoint, um, so slightly more theoretical, I guess, in some regards. And then we have uh, both Simon and Ruben who've uh, very kindly joined us today to also take you through some more practical real world uh, examples of, of what's actually going on in this space, which I think will give us a nice flavour for things. Um, so, OK, just as a quick rundown, uh, I'm going to take us through a concept overview, um, key features and benefits of the method itself, uh, which projects will actually be eligible uh, and the associated safeguards that go with them, uh, which I think is important to outline early. Um, the critical factors uh, for the burial chamber itself, uh, long term risks, associated liability and funding that goes with this. I'll also take you through um, as well as the quantification for uh, net carbon removal. So how we're calculating that, what's that based on uh, and then how could project developers or project proponents be paid for corks in the end? Um, I'll, he's not able to join us today, but we've uh, liaised with him um, and, and also had him present uh, at our advisory board, which is another one of our cross checks, uh, Florentino de la Cruz. Uh, he's been involved in this space for a number of years. It's three o'clock in the morning in North Carolina for him, so um, or, or somewhere like that. So we've we've left him in bed. But uh, I'd like to give a quick flavour of his research to show uh, where the science is headed uh, and where it was previously. Okay, so the concept itself. Uh, relatively simple. Um, 
uh, burying woody biomass in the ground uh, and creating and maintaining conditions which limit its decomposition over time. So on the left, uh, we have an example of a burial chamber from our New Zealand friends and for illustrative purposes uh, only, but just an example of what that may look like. Uh, and on the right, uh, I thought important to highlight some natural examples of, of this occurring over time. So we have uh, in an aquatic uh, environment, a preserved uh, Swedish warship, which is over 500 years old. And below uh, we have a, a tree from New Zealand uh, excavated that's uh, 40,000 years old. So why is this relevant? We're looking at uh, at least a hundred year durability with this method. So uh, rather than just uh, presenting uh, recent science, it's also nice to be able to rely on some natural examples to prove that this stuff can actually happen in reality. So uh, the key features and benefits of this method uh, to summarize, <coughs> excuse me, low risk, low cost, and potentially large scale. So to summarize the key features, um, particular, uh, particularly with this methodology, we have a hundred year responsibility, which is uh, also linked to the durability um, and the financing associated with this to maintain the conditions. So the conditions uh, in the pit such that uh, decomposition isn't occurring. Um, woody biomass is uh, lignin containing, so it naturally resists uh, decomposition. Uh, and we have engineered chambers uh, which cut these decomposition pathways. So I guess to summarize uh, some of the benefits um, alongside the features, <clears throat> as we perceive it, low risk of environmental harm. In other words, in the worst case, uh, the biomass would decay as it would pre-project. So uh, lo low risk in terms of other technologies that, that currently exist. Uh, potentially low cost, which is a big one uh, of, of carbon sequestration. Uh, and uh, a large potential to scale. Um, and I guess another one that I'd like to highlight is it's um, potentially an economically viable use for arid land globally as that continues to go. We have some other benefits there that are on the screen, but in, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll press on. So which projects are going to be eligible uh, and which are common um, qualification criteria to all of our projects. So I'll highlight our, our common uh, criteria first for all of our uh, methodologies. So that is that they are net negative in terms of their overall carbon footprint, which I guess is a fairly obvious statement anyhow, um, that there are environmental and social safeguards in place. Um, I'll elaborate on that in the next slide as I think it's important. Uh, and that there is additionality. So in other words, the project uh, wouldn't have happened without carbon finance. Specific to this methodology, um, in other words, and just to reiterate, uh, what are the main qualifying criteria? So you actually have the right to use the land for this method. Uh, that there is a trust fund or similar, it doesn't have to be exactly a trust fund, but a trust fund or similar, for long-term site management. In other words, that the money is there over time. Uh, the wood source itself um, at the moment from waste wood or from a purpose grown plantation. Um, Simon can elaborate on that uh, later as well as, as Ruben. Um, the chamber design itself. Um, so where the wood is actually being buried and encapsulated um, and the ability to detect uh, and destroy uh, methane. Environmental and social safeguards. Uh, so carrying on from uh, the previous slide, um, which I think is important to highlight. So the project to be, shall be able to demonstrate uh, environmental and social safeguards. Um, and a couple of these uh, I just wish to highlight. So uh, an environmental impact assessment, uh, an environmental permit, uh, and a plan for site closure after operation uh, decommissioning and rehabilitation. Uh, I think also useful to highlight that when applicable, the production facility, in other words, the project developer and associated facility and the activities um, uh, where applicable uh, will seek informed consent from local communities uh, and other affected stakeholders. So 
we're designing a, a protocol. So this will also be on a on a case by case basis. So where that's relevant, uh, that will need to be done and, and illustrated. OK, so now turning to the burial chamber itself. Um, as we've gone through our working group and as we've discussed with other uh, scientists in the field and other advisors, we've come up with a short list that I've highlighted here in blue of conditions that basically everybody agrees on. So I have a longer list there of, of nice to have, but the, the features that I've outlined there in blue are basically um, what I would almost define as, as non-negotiable. So I'll just give a quick rundown on those. Uh, the separation of the biomass or the woody biomass itself from the atmosphere, uh, really important. Uh, temperature control, uh, again, really important. Uh, a moisture range, and again, a range, not that there is or isn't moisture, but that it's in a, in a range that doesn't uh, promote methanogenesis. Um, so it can be incredibly dry or incredibly wet, but somewhere in between normally doesn't work. Uh, a low burial chamber, Oxygen level, also really important. Uh, the absence of light um, and the pH range, again, um, also has an impact. So the risk summary. Um, I tried to simplify this, uh, but as we see it, very low risk, low consequence, slow impact, which is also really important remediable, in other words, it can be fixed uh, and limited by compartmentalization or, or segregation of the chambers. So we see this as uh, being uh, not just a, a one size fits all or an all done at once process. This, this can be done before the burial itself uh, or after the burial. So before the burial, to give some uh, a couple of examples, uh, this can be, for example, site selection. So making sure that the, the site that you've actually chosen uh, makes sense for, for what you're trying to achieve and choosing uh, appropriate biomass. So in other words, biomass that has a, a lignin content so that it's naturally not going to decompose. Uh, after the burial, um, I think also very uh, important to illustrate that there's easy access to the chamber itself. Uh, this may not be the case uh, with other methods, methods, but however, with this uh, close to the surface, um, easy to access, so something can actually be done about it uh, if required. And also through time monitoring, so setting up uh, monitoring to know if something has actually occurred, uh, so something can be done about it, also really important. But again, to, to emphasise before and after and, and through time, uh, the risk can be uh, monitored and, and mitigated. OK, so as mentioned previously, I won't go through all of these points, but as mentioned previously, uh, specific to this method, uh, we're looking at having funds for what we've termed here post closure care. Um, so this can be a trust fund, but doesn't have to be. Um, it can be uh, something also similar, like a, a non for profit company or benevolent institution, but it, it depends uh, contextually. Uh, however, what's the purpose of this? That's that's what's important to highlight now. Um, the long term funding is there for monitoring and site management uh, through time, as we've spoken about, uh, for decommissioning and rehabilitation. And a really important one uh, to emphasise and to be understood is that the funding is proportional to the number of corks. So in other words, it's not just a fixed amount of money, no matter how large or small you are, it's proportional to the size of your operation. Um, I think that's that's really important. The others largely speak for themselves uh, and that things will be stated in, in current prices um, and the estimates should be looking at the operational life of the project. OK, so turning to how all this is calculated, uh, how people can be paid and how we're actually quantifying things. So for this part, I'd like to focus on uh, stable gross CO2 stored. However, obviously our net CO2 removed, which is the cork itself, uh, the tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent, um, is, is what will be people will be paid on the basis of. But for now, I'd just like to focus on the stable gross CO2 uh, calculated. So let me just turn the laser pointer on here. OK, so 
This is for illustrative purposes only. However, it's to give a, a flavor for how things could be calculated for a typical project, shall we say. So what's important to take note of here, um, we're calling these supply chain emissions. In other words, emissions associated with actually setting up the production facility or setting up the activity. We assume that there's going to be an emissions intensity associated with that, whether it happens to just be uh, digging a pit um, or, or whatever else it may be, transporting uh, timber. There's going to be emissions intensity associated with that at the start of the life and at the end of the life. So, and in orange here is our estimate uh, for illustrative purposes of, of economic leakage. So in other words, what would happen if the biomass was used for something else uh, or if the land was used for something else? Um, the important part here um, and negative numbers here are good. In other words, this is illustrating that carbon uh, is being sequestered over time. And this is an example of how this gross uh, calculation might be able to be uh, conceptualized. Okay, a uh, really important one. This methodology takes the default value for expected re-emissions. In other words, what would happen if the wood or the woody biomass were to decompose? What percentage of that may go back to atmosphere? And this is what this slide is about. So we have taken this figure from uh, the current IPCC guidelines from 2019, uh, which stipulate, uh, and this is landfill. So I'd also like to just emphasize this point. We're looking at doing the opposite to this. So this number has come from an environment or a setting uh, that is actually promoting uh, decomposition and isn't at all trying to inhibit it. Um, this is a, an industry, and Ruben can speak to this, that has been uh, trying to actually promote methanogenesis so they can harvest it as a fuel source. So we're, we believe this to be a very conservative estimate, given that it's from a, a setting that, that's been attempting or, or, or achieving to do the opposite. So we have a stability factor from this. In other words, how stable is the woody biomass that's in the ground? Um, and here we're saying um, as, a, as a bar or a threshold, 91.2% is stable, and that's literally doing a one minus the re-emissions factor. So a one minus the 8.8 to give us the, the 91.2. Um, here on the left in our graphic, all we're saying is this is when it's deposited into the ground. So this is when the woody biomass is actually put in the ground. And this is what would happen over time. And this is therefore uh, the calculation that we're giving at the start in terms of that um, rate of decomposition or st stability factor. So just to re-emphasize where this has come from, and I'll turn briefly to Tino's uh, research after this. Um, it's come from chapter three of solid waste disposal. So uh, as I outlined before, and, and I guess uh, another, just to emphasize it again, we're looking at controlling these conditions so that this doesn't occur. So we really believe that this is a, uh, a very conservative estimate. Um, but I just wanted to illustrate where this has come from, uh, where and why we're quoting this, and also to illustrate that uh, Tino, that we've actually been um, in collaboration with uh, and trying to understand this better ourselves, was also one of the authors uh, on this paper that's actually been referenced here. So this is Tino, just to give everyone a, a flavor of some of the people that we speak to as we're going through this process uh, from North Carolina University. Uh, has been heavily involved in IPCC uh, decomposition estimates over time, as I've outlined, really important for us because we want to know what happens if um, something isn't working, how bad could it actually be? Uh, and it seems like it's, it's fairly reasonable as long as the woody biomass contains lignin. So he's been on this journey for uh, many, many years um, and has been helping us to understand this phenomena better. So I just wanted to outline briefly and not to speak uh, for his research, but basically just to present it briefly to you so you're aware of what's going on in this field at the moment. Um, he's currently looking at um, 
In very simple terms, what happens if you chop woody biomass up into tiny little pieces? In other words, increase the surface area enormously, also, which we're not doing, uh, and then try to decompose it. So the result that we're getting down in the bottom, let me just turn the laser pointer on again, is showing us here for a particular wood type that effectively after a couple of hundred days, we are getting effectively no result at all. So no change, which is what we're looking for. So if we're putting something in the ground, is something continuing to happen or is it actually ceasing to occur and has it become dormant? So that's his uh, research. And this is based on uh, nine years of, as I've already stated, chopping the, the wood or the woody biomass into very, very small pieces so that there's a large surface area to act upon and trying to decompose it. So if we're able to get that result there, um, I think logically it, it should be possible uh, to do the opposite. So that's the end of my overview. I'll stop sharing my screen. We can obviously go to questions at the end, as Marianne has stated. But uh, for now, if uh, you're ready, Simon, I'll stop sharing my screen and, and throw across to you. And thank you in advance. Thanks, Ruben. I mean, thanks, uh, Leonard. Sorry about that, mate. Pleasure, um, mate. Is my screen on? Can you see I, my screen? I can see your screen, yes. Is, has mine disappeared? Yep. OK, I great. can see it. I can see it. So, um... Thank you. I'll just get a laser pointer going. So. I'm using our old branding. We're, we're, we're changing our name to Into Earth. Um, we were previously enhanced biomass sequestration, um, so I'm sorry we're using um, the old branding here, but we haven't quite formally uh, launch this new branding. So what we believe is our solution is a game changing high quality carbon dioxide removal solution, scalable, affordable, high durability storage, actually a better than no harm solution um, and socially acceptable. The picture on the right here is to give you a sense of the kind of plants that we're talking about. This is an example of uh, a eucalyptus woodland in low rainfall, uh, marginal farmland country in Western Australia. Um, and this was the, the, the bush, as we, we say, um, that was cleared uh, to, to facilitate farming. And that what we have is instead of, as on the right of this picture, uh, a dark woodland cover, we have very, very broad acre, essentially a summertime desert that's been cleared of all of its native cover. And uh, this is the land that, that we're going to be focusing on in our solution. So our solution is really the creation of a nature-based carbon pump. The model is to grow Australian dry land coppicing woody plants on degraded low rainfall and failing previously cleared farmland. So very typically that kind of land that we saw in the picture on the slide before. Then when these plants grow, periodically harvest them of their above ground biomass. Sequester this harvested biomass in subterranean chambers engineered to close the pathways for biomass decomposition as illustrated by Lennon earlier. And then repeat, the plants that we have in view here are coppicing, that is they regrow after harvest. And the, the, the harvest, the uh, sequestration model that we have here is essentially to dig um, pit, uh, uh, trenches in uh, hypersaline, uh, groundwater uh, inundated terrain um, where when we dig the pits we'll have to dewater in the first place dig the pits narrow relatively deep and put in the biomass compact the biomass seal it with high with high clay content soil formally compact that soil um, turn the pumps off 
and let the groundwater refill in the pits so that these th this biomass will be stored in an anoxic environment um, in completely immersed in hypersaline groundwater. And when I say hypersaline, this is about 250,000 parts per million, uh, five times saltier than the sea. So let me make a little sidebar on secondary salination. This is a, cons uh, a phenomena that's not really familiar in many parts of the world. So basically, to create the farmland um, in the kinds of areas we're talking about, deep-rooted woodland trees were removed so that they could grow shallow-rooted exotic crops like wheat and so forth. What this led to was an overcharging of the water table and the saline water grows to within the capillary action zone over a greater area than previously. Repeated rounds of evaporation, because evaporation is higher than precipitation in this, in this area. Repeated rounds of evaporation, it leaves behind salt and increases the salinity of the groundwater. This is Australia's biggest environmental disaster. 6% of arable land across the country has already been lost. Another 25% is at risk. So the, the picture, the upper picture here is a, a, a very good illustration because one of the things to look for if you're looking for secondary salination effects is the kind of dead tree, dead trees. The lower pictures are secondary sal salination sites where, we are, where we're conducting a field trial of a burial chamber. And what you can see there is um, exploration drilling taking place for a burial site. Our solution um, has a great carbon outcome. So we estimate about 13 tonnes per hectare of carbon dioxide removal per annum on land with a rainfall in the range of 300 millimetres. And this, because of the nature of this, this solution as a carbon pump, it's repeatable indefinitely for as long as CDR is required. What this means is that unlike a perpetual forest, so if you replanted the woodland, it would grow, absorb carbon till it reached maturity, and then the carbon content of the forest would be in equilibrium. So we, we project over 100 years, this per unit area, this solution is something like six times more effective than a perpetual forest. Over 200 years, 12 times more effective. Over 15 years, three times, over 50 years, three times more effective. So we can run this system for as long as required um, for carbon dioxide removal. The economics here are robust. It's very affordable. Um, we can start delivering this in the near term. There's, there's in, in principle, there's nothing tricky here, growing trees, harvesting the bi above ground biomass, bearing that biomass means that we can start in the very near term. The great thing about this solution is that it delivers uh, more secure and more employment um, in, in the communities in our target area. And it's meaning, meaningfully scalable, scalable elsewhere in, in the world. So the picture on the right hand side here is our initial target area, the eastern margins of the West Australian wheat belt. Um, this is about uh, 350 kilometres or so east of where I'm sitting here in Fremantle. Um, and the 2.2 million hectare target area there is land that prob should probably have never been cleared in the first place. And to, just to give you an idea of scale here, 2.2 million hectares is the area of Wales or the state of New Jersey. And the total population um, in this area is two and a half thousand people. Uh, I think New Jersey is uh, eight or nine million people and Wales is over three million people. So essentially no one lives here. And these populations in, the, in this area has been going down and down and down as um, agriculture, the farming practices here have had to increase in scale to respond to the threat, the, the, the challenges created by both climate change and increasing international competition. As we look globally, there's a fair bit of this kind of marginal country around the world. So think about where hot deserts meet farmland. There's uh, a great deal of this in Australia. Africa is hugely prospective. 
uh, northern Mexico, southern United States, there's plenty of places around the world where this solution may be applicable. Our plan is obviously to start in Australia um, and, and, and learn as we go along. So, so globally, there's some 400 million hectares of suitable land in the 270 to 275 millimetre to 375 millimetre range with the right climatic type. Our plan is to get a uh, sequestration full field trial fully operational by March. In fact, I'm going to give me a tick on that because we've got um, a trials up and running. So we've we've dug two two chambers and filled them with biomass, a dry chamber and a wet chamber, the hypersaline chamber. And so this is the process by which we constructed the, the dry chamber, um, basically drilling top left down to the sealed chamber on the bottom um, with the team standing proudly on their uh, on, on their work there. Um, our, start, our plan from here is to complete our startup funding this year, plan our first commercial scale module from mid 2023, scale towards 10 million cork per annum by 2030 in Australia. And then if it scales, who knows where we can, where we can end up with this solution. Thank you for your attention. I hope that was of some interest. Thanks enormously, yeah. Simon. Much appreciated. Ruben, I guess the floor's yours whenever you're ready, Matt. Great. Let me know if you can see those slides. Yes, sir. Good to go. Hey, thanks, Leonard. Thank you, Simon, and thanks everyone for coming along to listen about listen to this uh, methodology. Look forward to hearing your feedback on the specific solution that I'm proposing and the the wider methodology. So, EnviroNZ are experts in the management of anaerobic chambers. We're a leading waste management company here in New Zealand. Revenue of over three hundred million dollars per annum. Staff of about a thousand and about six hundred vehicles. So we operate collections, aggregation and disposal facilities. So we bury over a million tonnes of refuse in anaerobic landfills per annum. And so we're experts in managing the production and destruction of methane. Landfills are covered by an emissions trading scheme here in New Zealand. So we're highly incentivized to capture and destroy any methane that might be produced in our landfills. Um, because of this experience, we know quite a bit about what materials produce how much methane, and that's how we uh, became involved in this project. Basically, biomass burial and landfill disposal require the same expertise, which is the ability to reliably control anaerobic degradation. So forestry residue is available at scale in New Zealand and is an environmental hazard. So there's about 6 million tonnes of forest residue produced each year in New Zealand. We have quite a large forestry industry. Uh, forest residue is uh, the leftover components of the tree. So basically unmerchantable portions of logs. So the picture on the top right there is a typical waste pile at a forest processing site. So this feedstock has no economic value and currently degrades in situ. So it is just left in the forest in a pile like you see there and degrades over about a five to ten year period aerobically that is um, so the co-benefits of using forest residue for a biomass burial project are increasing the profitability of forestry which encourages more planting and further carbon sequestration reducing the environmental hazard posed by forest residue so on the bottom right there you can see some of the damage that can be caused from this waste being left in the forest after a harvest and then following a rainfall event. Uh, and then obviously creating green jobs. So here's a, a basic uh, diagram of the carbon cycle in a forest. So carbon is sequestered through photosynthesis from the atmosphere into the woody biomass. When that woody biomass is harvested, it has three basic return paths to the atmosphere, the carbon in it does, sorry. So that's either through bioenergy, where it's burned for uh, either heat or electricity, uh, through wooden building products, which it may enjoy a, a long 
a stable life of about 50 to 100 years in a, in a house, or it may be shipped offshore to be used in temporary building products with a half-life of about two and a half years, which often happens with New Zealand wood. And the third, the third path back to the atmosphere being waste. So it did used to be burned in New Zealand. These days it's more commonly left to biodegrade in the forest floor. So the project aims to break that third return path to the atmosphere and divert that waste uh, residue into a carbon storage chamber. Here's another diagram of the chamber. So the chamber is a controlled and fully encapsulated dry chamber. The biomass is compacted. The chamber is enveloped in an impermeable liner, this black um, portion of the diagram here. Uh, which results in anaerobic conditions. It's basically like a big balloon at this stage. Uh, decomposition is inhibited by maintaining moisture levels below that required for anaerobic degradation. Any decomposition that does occur is monitored through gas wells, and any biogas produced is flared, so it's released as carbon dioxide rather than the more potent methane. We do have uh, natural examples of this process here in New Zealand. So excavated swamp kauri, which is a native tree species here, have been buried in wetlands for up to 60,000 years. Got two pictures here of, of trees that have been excavated, dated to over 40,000 years old, and you can actually still see the bark intact. So this is a natural example of anaerobic biomass preservation, which underpins the proposed methodology. That's all from me. I uh, look forward to answering some questions on this and the general methodology. Thanks. Thank you uh, all, uh, Leonard, Simon and Ruben. And uh, really uh, nice to see the chat <clears throat> going on. There are experts already in the audience and some answers are being uh, given uh, already there so that is uh, both uh, keep keep the questions coming and uh, also the answers uh, whatever uh, views and experts uh, we have in the audience uh, but uh, let me start with the questions that we had uh, received uh, beforehand uh, so um, uh, to the two uh, projects here uh, that are the practical examples of uh, of a theory of a methodology uh, what type of biomass uh, are you using and why exactly that type? So, uh, Ruben, if you could uh, start and tell uh, about your project. Sure. So we are aiming to use a, a waste product as a feedstock. So um, about well, somewhere over 95% of the plantation forests in New Zealand are Pinus radiata, so it's most likely to be Pinus radiata. Um, I should have mentioned in the presentation, and there's a question relevant to this in the chat now, but we're only planning on burying feedstock that is consolidated at the processing site. So some of the feedstock, uh, some of the some forest residue is quite valuable to forest land. It provides carbon and, and some nutrients back to the soil. It also provides stability for a clear felled uh, forest site after harvesting. So we're not planning on removing the residue that is left at the point where the tree is cut down, only the residue that is left in a large pile up at the processing site. Um, so that is the residue that provides an environmental hazard, and that's how we can provide the dual benefit of carbon sequestration and removing the hazard of large piles of, of forest residue. OK, and I guess that the reason why you are using that is because one reason is because it's available and uh, are there any other reasons? No, there's about this. I mean, there's six million tons or so of it available, so that's pretty attractive. Um, it's also very difficult to biodegrade. So the slide you showed earlier, Leonard, um, that was a pine species down on the very bottom there that showed no degradation over the, the nine years. So softwoods are, have a higher lignin content and are more difficult to biodegrade. So that's quite attractive as well, obviously. OK, so it's the right type of woody biomass that would uh, we be nicely uh, preserved. And uh, Simon, a recap of your uh, type of uh, biomass, uh, woody biomass and, and the reasoning. 
Okay, so what we're looking at is a mix of uh, native acacias and eucalypts. So we'll be growing a mixed um, self source plantation. Um, and one of the questions um, pointed out that I, I was not clear that these are coppicing plants, which means if you cut the above, above ground biomass off, they regrow, they re sprout from the roots. Um, this is an adaption typical in Australian trees from fire. Um, so, so these trees re regrow and regrow vigorous, vigorously um, after coppicing. So these, these trees are highly adapted to the target area and mimic the ecosystem of the woodland that was cleared um, in our initial target area for farming about 100 years ago. Um, they're well adapted to climate, drought, local pests, extreme, um, extreme weather conditions, the heat and so forth. And they're also stream, extremely water use efficient plants. Um, and they're, 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 they are terrific at growing biomass in these um, trying conditions. They produce about 10 times the biomass of um, the current land use. Uh, they also, they're also very good for um, improving soil retention and soil quality with obvious, obviously uh, a fair proportion of the leaf, the leaf litter and twig litter on the ground will be left um, to, to help, help uh, re restore soil nutrition. And it's also a solution that helps some restore some lost hobbit and habitat. Not perfect, but a step in the right direction. Okay, thank you both. Uh, the um, uh, there was a question about uh, re-emissions uh, sent beforehand. How do you know if re-emissions are occurring, and what do you do uh, if they are? If we now uh, take uh, Ruben again uh, first in your uh, plan project. Uh, Chris, would you like to answer this one? We've got Chris Love, the, um, the colleague of mine on the call here. Yeah, sure, uh, Ruben. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Ruben. And you can uh, switch on your. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Uh, if, if there is any re emission, um, it'll it's most likely going to be via gas as as in, in our case the chamber is lined and 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 essentially sealed it's a hdpe uh plastic liner both on the base the sides and and the, and the cap and those emissions they're likely to be in the form of carbon dioxide carbon monoxide or uh, methane and so in, in our design, we've allowed, as Ruben pointed out, for to monitor any anything in the gas phase through through a uh, a gas monitoring well, and so that would allow us to monitor the volume and composition of the gas at that single gas exit point, and as a result of that, um, we'd be able to. basically see what was what was causing it but whether it whether the re-emission was associated with anaerobic digestion being methane or aerobic um, degradation and if it was aer aerobic degradation it might mean that there's a leak in the surface um, of the chamber and so through a using a gas rover much like you do on a landfill you run over the surface of the landfill with a with a methane detection device you can or gas detection device uh, we would do that over the cell uh, find where the weak point might be in the exterior and obviously be able to fix that up these chambers are quite close to the surface and that's one of the advantages of the technology it allows us to go in and fix things up if we find um, something wrong if there if if in the case that there is um, methane being produced as uh, Ruben pointed out we've got a, the ability to flare any any methane, albeit very small um, amounts are expected, uh, if any at all. And um, if that was the case, if there was some form of high methane coming out, then we could use 
through the gas well, we can inject nitrogen um, into the into the chamber to uh, remove the chance of um, any uh, carbon dioxide being formed as a result of aerobic degradation as well. So it sounds like uh, the, the, these are the things that you do daily in, in Enviro NZ uh, uh, la landfill business. How much of those uh, um, competencies and equipment can you reuse uh, in this uh, woody biomass burial uh, method? Oh, um, yeah, all, all, all that standard um, gas monitoring equipment that we use at the landfill would be appropriate and applicable um, for use at, in the burial chamber um, methodology. So, yeah, totally transferable. Okay, good to hear. And uh, Simon, uh, in well, your design, it's a bit different. So how do you detect that and act? So so we, we've gone with an early warning system uh, that involves a gas monitoring approach as well, but also we've got we're thinking of having temperature and pH probes um, in in the pits uh, because you know all biomass degradation is exothermic, it creates heat. Uh, we can also monitor the water water level, but we also um, have the additional uh, capability to um, to 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 undertake direct investigation of any chamber that seems to be misbehaving by drilling and taking samples of biomass, water, soil, and we can do chemical and uh, microbiological analysis on, on, on that um, and, and also take corrective action. As Chris um, and Ruben have pointed out, that it, it, one of the great parts of this system is the fact that it's near the surface. You know exactly where it is. You know exactly what's going in. Thank you. Uh, both. Uh, then uh, let, there was um, some so I'll pick uh, some questions from the from the chat uh, here. Uh, there was a question about fire, a risk of fire, uh, especially in Australia, but I guess also in uh, New Zealand. Uh, the of course, what what is buried can catch fire. So if uh, both of you would uh, address that question, Simon. Simon first. Seeing I'm in the fire prone country, I'll go first. Um, so, so we get rewarded for biomass, uh, for carbon credits only once the biomass goes in the pit. So we don't really don't want to lose any to fire. So uh, fire management will be core business for us. Um, and once the biomass is in the pit, the risk of fire is extremely low, in fact, disappearing towards zero. Um, our plantation layouts will, will actually have inbuilt fire breaks. So, so there'll be um, machinery movement corridors. So the uh, belts of planted um, trees and plants, and then, the, and then a gap. We'll also have a capability to, uh, to do um, supplementary watering in the early stages. So we'll have fairly large amounts of water on hand and the uh, means for you know, very effective firefighting. So, so the, the big risks with fires actually aren't typically in these forests. The very big fires are much in, in the much wetter areas like Victoria and southwest Western Australia, where where you have you know ma massive forests with huge fuel load burdens. We will be managing that fuel load, load burden very aggressively, well not aggressively, but um, with the with the objective of actually getting carbon credits. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and uh, Chris or, or Ruben, your fire risks in, in your type of project. Just quickly from me and then to you, Chris. So firstly, we're reducing the fire risk by pulling the large piles of residue out of the forest so that, that that particular fire risk is reduced. But then, Chris, if you'd like to speak to the chances of and then remediation of fire within the pit itself. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as Simon said, you know, our pit is underground, it's buried, and you know, to create fire, you've got to have a fire triangle of oxygen, fuel, and a source of ignition. So um, by ensuring that our, 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 our pit is underground and um, both uh, with very little to no oxygen present, uh, we're confident that there wouldn't be any um, any chance of fire in the underground uh, pit. 
And in terms of yeah. remediation, we, we can use the addition of nitrogen. Um, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Again, oxygen. again, if there was ox if there was oxygen in in the pit at, at unacceptable levels, then we can we can uh, basically fill the chamber with nitrogen to uh, remove that oxygen, and obviously would be looking to find out where that oxygen was getting into the pit, and we'd repair that again um, to ensure that uh, there wasn't uh, a repeat of that um, oxygen ingress. OK, and uh, li like uh, one of you mentioned earlier, it's in compartments, so not all of it is at risk. Uh, oh, at that, the well, well, yeah, well, that's right. Um, that's a good point, Marianne, is, is that uh, the, 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 the chambers get built in cells, so as, as each cell is, is covered with soil, a new area is opened up, so uh, it would be the the chance of uh, lightning strike onto uh, wood waste that's in a, in a in a partly filled cell. You know, it would it would be uh, a small amount of material that would be exposed at the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So sounds like the uh, whatever is the, on top of the ground is uh, is a higher risk, and uh, you are to some extent reducing that risk in, in New Zealand. There are uh, several questions related to the 100 years uh, maintenance uh, responsibility. Uh, how is uh, that uh, possible? Uh, when is decommissioning happening and what kind of monitoring is um, uh, required or needed uh, or planned to be done after that. So if you could uh, address that first, uh, Leonard, telling what is required in, in the methodology, what are the requirements, and then uh, both of the uh, projects, how do you plan to implement and comply with those requirements? Yeah, sure. So I, I guess I'll just go back to what I spoke about previously in our uh, in the the presentation, but prescriptively from our side, I guess you could view our uh, the methodology more as a protocol, and then I'll let um, uh, Simon and Ruben speak to the the specifics of this. But I think uh, over that that hundred year period, what's certainly important is that there is an appropriate uh, land title uh, that goes with the area where the, the burial is actually taking place. That there actually is uh, a monitoring and maintenance plan uh, over time, and that there's also uh, funds to make sure that that this happens so that um, 50 or 60 years in the future there's still uh, money there for, for this to be done so that's prescriptively uh, an overview from our side but again uh, each project has its own contextual specifics so I think um, if if either Simon or Ruben I think we've been uh, whoever would like to go first to, to elaborate on the the contextual realities of that point rather than the, the overarching protocol Oh, okay, so I'll go first. Um, in our case, what we're seeing is our, our system as a vertically integrated production system. So we'll be growing the biomass as well as bearing it. Um, and this, we, the vision is to keep this operational on a site for many years. And uh, so burial maintenance will be part of the ordinary operation of the business until um, until a site, the whole site is decommissioned. At the end of that operations process, uh, all of the monitoring equipment, the monitoring protocols, the monitoring regime, the maintenance uh, regime will be well established for that site, well understood in detail, and we'll be generating a fund to, to cover the costs of that. Actually, we're going for in perpetuity, not just 100 years, uh, where where those funds will be um, set aside as a proportion from the sale of every cork. Um, and, you know, if we operate on a site for 100 years, that'll be a very, very large fund um, uh, 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 with, with sufficient resources associated with it for, to hopefully uh, maintain the um, monitoring, maintenance, corrective um, action as necessary for you know, thousands of years, not just hundreds of years, not just a hundred years. That's our vision. 
Um, and the only thing I'd just add to that is that there's no expectation that this carbon will be returned to the atmosphere at year 101. It's more of a, a sort of practical limit on how long uh, there should be obligations to monitor and measure a site. Um, perhaps it won't be relevant for Simon, who plans on operating on the same site for multiple years, but it may be that our project operates on one site in one year and another site in another year. It's very hard to make a project stack up if you have one year of income and then a thousand years of costs associated with measurement and monitoring. Um, I, I think that's part of the reason for there being a, a, a limit at 100 years. It's not about yeah. the carbon actually returning in year 101. And, and Ruben and Simon, there seems to be some confusion around the word decommissioning, maybe? Yes. Uh, yeah, maybe that's uh, worth, worth explaining. Uh, yes, uh, and I uh, think this uh, active uh, uh, site management when the burial is still happening and then the passive when there is only some uh, yeah. periodic. Yeah. So may, maybe a, a recap of what is normal in, in landfill or some other areas where these kind of responsibilities are long, uh, 30 yeah, years, yeah. 50 years. Yeah, yeah, no, great uh, segue, uh, Marian. So, so in the landfill industry, you you have an active landfill, and then once the landfill's full, it becomes uh, closed landfill, and you're into uh, what's called um, post-closure aftercare period. And so, what's being proposed here, and the methodology that Leonard uh, put forward, is parallels the the modern engineered landfill waste industry that there's aftercare periods, management plans, and money available to ensure that that um, monitoring, uh, measurement and management continues on. And those aftercare periods, uh, minimum 30 years, they're more normally 50 years now, and they're being you know, increased uh, all the time. So. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, that, that is definitely the, the 100 years uh, uh, is uh, definitely a long promise in uh, if we think uh, these uh, types of uh, where nature or, or forest is uh, uh, involved or would. Uh, th there is uh, questions about uh, additionality and then also the equation or the formula, how are things uh, calculated? So on the uh, additionality, if we do a similar round that Leonard captures first, what is uh, required for every project and then uh, Ruben and Simon or you would uh, address uh, how, how the carbon financing is uh, in relation to your actual project. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Marianne. So I think uh, generally speaking, um, I guess it's clear to, to us that these projects uh, both are additional, i.e. they wouldn't have happened without um, carbon finance. I, I think that's uh, relatively clear from, from what's been outlined. But again, I, I guess with the, the concept of additionality itself, it is very very case specific. Um, so I, I think it's also um, relevant in terms of the project economics that Simon's outlined nicely um, and, and that Ruben's spoken to that maybe in terms of the projects themselves, in terms of their own uh, thoughts on that, it maybe gives a nicer flavour to what is a very broad concept. Okay. Um, You're first this time, Ruben. Okay, sure. Uh, this this one's quite easy for us. Um, there's simply no motivation for us to go and collect or probably buy, transport and then bury um, this forest residue other than for the sequestration of carbon. Um, a bit of backstory on this project for us. We actually first approached this from a wood waste perspective. We bury quite a lot of timber waste in our landfills and have noticed that it doesn't uh, decompose. But the, the case for that fell over on this argument of additionality. So basically, even in a typical municipal solid waste landfill, we're already sequestering a lot of carbon through that wood waste. So by putting in a specifically designed carbon storage chamber, we don't actually add any benefit to the atmosphere. So 
um, we have walked away from one feedstock because it, it did not show any additionality. And we have chosen this one, which clearly does show additionality because the, the feedstock um, currently degrades on the forest floor. There's no one using it. I'll just also address a couple of questions I've seen pop up about biochar and other competing uses for feedstock. This feedstock degrades on the, current, on the forest floor currently in, in almost every forest in New Zealand. There is, there is no competing use for this feedstock. Um, and our economics, maybe they aren't as good as Simon's by the sounds, they're pretty tight. If we had to compete with another use, I don't think we would win. So um, I think we're quite protected against competing with other, you know, maybe what some people consider better ways of storing carbon. We think this is a pretty good one and uh, it's using a feedstock that no one else wants. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, in our case, um, this business is only focused on the generation of corks and the sale of corks without a carbon market in which to deliver um, uh, carbon certificates and to gain financial recognition for that. There's no way that we would be financeable. Uh, it would have to be purely philanthropic. And I don't think anyone's going to do it at this kind of scale that we've got in view. Oh, in in your case, no biomass would be there uh, without carbon finance, and in Ruben's case, it would be uh, left where it is and and uh, decompose there, or catch fire, uh, like you said, that the fire risk is is uh, there. Uh, there were, uh, of course, when. Uh, issuing corks for any methodology there needs to be the quantification of how much carbon is put into the storage and that is a big bulk of the methodology the calculation or the equation of how uh, does that happen there was a question in the chat uh, asking for emissions emissions especially from the plantation are they calculated uh, and uh, how is E gross? So how much uh, gross carbon is stored or buried uh, where then the emissions are deducted? So uh, uh, Leonard, uh, what does the methodology say on this? Uh, well, as I was taking everybody through with the previous slide, I can I won't bring it back up again. But effectively, that things are, are netted out. So I guess in in Simon's example, uh, there'll be an emissions intensity associated with actually uh, setting up the plantation, harvesting, digging the pits, every all of the activities that are actually um, in advance of actually putting things in the ground, uh, and that will need to be netted away from what is actually sequestered from atmosphere in a, in a very simplistic sense. Rubens will be different. Uh, the context is different. Uh, there'll be an emissions intensity associated with, in his example, uh, actually procuring the logs and transporting them to where they need to be buried. Um, from the work that we've done alongside him, it seems like that will be done in a way that's very um, cost effective and therefore uh, emissions effective. But effectively, it's it's taking uh, what would be going back to the atmosphere as a result of the operations, uh, and and remove uh, taking that away from from what can actually be proved to be sequestered. So every uh, all emissions are accounted for uh, from the uh, gross uh, sequestered. Uh, how, how about the gross sequestered? How do you know how much carbon is buried? It will be uh, measured and then that will be monitored through time. So I guess in terms of how that will actually be measured, I think that also might be, be useful for um, uh, Ruben or Simon to speak to how that will actually be measured um, and, and then monitored uh, through time. I've, I've spoken to the stability factor, but I guess uh, taking that those measurements is also very important and that we can actually have them verified and, and audited so that we're actually clear on, on what's going in the pit and, and what remains. So. Uh, maybe if you guys would like to give a, a, a flavour of how that can be measured so that, yes. uh, in other words, where our numbers are coming from for that calculation. Well, the, um, for, for us, the one of the attractions of this solution is the potential for a, a direct measurement 
So, so we'll be weighing every parcel of biomass that goes in the pit and also sampling it on a statistically valid basis. So we'll be able to calculate the carbon value content of the biomass going into the pit by multiplying um, the weight of the biomass going in the pit with its by its carbon content as determined through statistically valid sampling. So it's pretty straightforward um, and, and quite typical, I think, in, for, in the forestry sector as well to, to, to measure carbon, carbon in this way. Yep, nothing too different here. Basically, we use a Weybridge. We sample the content, uh, sample the feedstock for moisture content and for carbon content on a dry basis, and we use those three numbers exactly. to determine the amount of carbon in the, going into the pit. Okay, sounds like a rather simple way of uh, weighing kilograms or, or tons uh, and then uh, using those uh, moisture and carbon content uh, knowledge as a multiplier. Um, maybe a couple of uh, questions more uh, before we uh, finish here. Very nice to see, see the dialogue ongoing and remember that uh, this, uh, this uh, recording uh, and the um, draft methodology will be available after this uh, webinar and uh, there is a formula or form asking for your feedback and, and your comments so uh, there is possibility to give these uh, your views uh, also after this event so uh, is there uh, something that uh, has caught your eye that you would like to address uh, uh, in Ruben, Simon, or or Leonard. Quite a lot to talk about the nutrients and leaving the important nutrients in the forest. I think that your in neither of your cases there is actually no forest to leave them <laughs> into or yeah, Ruben has already left them or somebody before. <laughs> has left them there and Simon has no forest until you put the plants there. Sorry, Simon, uh, go ahead. Yeah, you go, Simon, and I'll, I'll add to it. So, so um, it's probably better to think of this solution as a farming solution rather than a forestry solution. Uh, it, it'll, it'll operate very, very like a farming business um, where we'll be harvesting on a probably a two-year cycle, two-year rotation, um, and uh, the, we will be we will be using very low doses of fertilizer to um, encourage the, the growth of particularly the eucalypts because they respond very well to this to to, to this, but it'll be much less um, fertilizer than currently used um, in the land use out there. Um, so think 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 of this much more like a farming business than a forestry forestry business. Okay. Um, and so for us, th there's very little nutrient content in the woody biomass itself. There is some in the pine needles, and perhaps even the the smaller parts of the tree, like the branches. Most of that, in our case, is left in the forest. So the the feedstock that we're going after. The trees are cut down on a, sleep, a steep slope and they are hauled up to a processing site where the logs are cut into different sizes into different grades. Any residue from that in-forest processing activity is tipped over the edge is what they call it and it is like it sounds they push it over the edge of the processing site. So most of the material that we will be uh, burying A comes from one large pile, so not spread throughout the forest, which is how you get uh, the nutrients back into the soil, and B, won't contain much green material at all. It will all be uh, mainly carbon. Okay, thank you both. Uh, there is um, uh, one question about uh, methane, or maybe more, but uh, uh, so uh, are credits only generated once when biomass is buried? or spread over years and uh, what is the buffer applied considering there may be methane emissions? 
Sure. So I'll take that quickly, Marianne. Uh, the, the buffer that I spoke through earlier relates to the stability factor. So the 8.8%. And to be clear, uh, we believe that to be conservative, but we also um, would like to have some field trials to prove that to be accurate. But we think the number is likely to be far less. But uh, that number is subtracted at the beginning. And if you can prove that that is not the case uh, through time uh, with uh, measuring and monitoring what's actually going on, then that can be uh, reduced. But we're setting that as as the threshold at the beginning um, to be conservative, but that's where that also applies to the gross calculation. So anything that you would calculate, that would be deducted from that at the beginning uh, before uh, anything has happened. And in terms of uh, the credits, uh, so uh, again, case specific, but um, nothing's going to actually be paid until things are put in the ground. So it's not a, a theoretical exercise where, where something is paid out before something's actually been done. Things need to go on the ground. The conditions need to be met. Things need to be verified and audited such that uh, the protocols are actually followed. Uh, then the, the emissions factor for methane is then subtracted in advance of anything being paid out. Um, and then things can be done on an annual basis. So Simon's operation is, is quite different uh, to Ruben's and, and may go for a different time period. Therefore, things aren't compensated in the same way, um, which I think is fairly obvious business logic. But maybe Simon or Ruben, you'd like to just briefly speak to that as well. Yeah, I, I think especially uh, methane, so this annual um, that you report how much was buried and how what much was emitted and, and there is a third party independent uh, verifier that checks that the balance afterwards is before crediting, before uh, issuing corks uh, is uh, the same uh, method for all uh, for, uh, carbon removal methodologies. Uh, the methane emissions, uh, how do you, yeah, um, coming back to that, uh, if it happens, what do you do with it? So uh, we we plan on flaring any methane produced, so it would be released to the atmosphere as, as carbon dioxide. Uh, probably the volumes are going to be so low that we will actually need to introduce another fuel to actually get it to burn. But that's that's still our plan is to is to flare it. OK, and turn it to uh, carbon dioxide, which is uh, uh, less. Uh, yeah, not causing a uh, new uh, method. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I would like to uh, ask the last questions uh, to uh, all of you. Uh, in the panel, so uh, thank you very much for giving your expertise and practical examples here. Uh, thank you also to the experts in the audience and all the questions. Uh, so in your opinion, uh, what would be the worst scenario and the best scenario that can happen in, in your uh, woody biomass burial project? If you start, uh, Simon. Starting with the worst, um, probably the worst thing that can happen for us is uh, neglect uh, in the sense that the areas where we bury the biomass, it's it's um, ne it's never going to be a, a population centre, it's never going to rival the Grand Canyon as a tourist, tourist destination, it'll never be an industrial centre. You know, it's not going to be a centre for solar power or wind. Uh, so, so just straightforward neglect is neglect is a potential problem and that was uh, why we thought about um, the fund idea that we would need a long-term fund to maintain the rage about monitoring and maintenance and management of our of our pits and our state uh, the long-term estate that we would establish the best thing that can happen um, well I think the best thing that can happen is that we collectively uh, meet the challenge of excess carbon in the atmosphere and not just woody biomass burial, but all the things we have to do for that. Um, and that our solution is uh, no longer required and we can transition this land to um, other sustainable uses. 
we'd really like in Australia, we'd really like to rewild the land that we're using for growing biomass, biomass um, put back the woodlands that should never have been cleared in the first place. That's that's that that's probably the best thing that could happen for us. Thank you, Simon. And uh, Ruben, your worst and best. Sure. And again, worst first. Um, the worst case for us would just be that the chamber demonstrates similar degradation to a municipal solid waste landfill. So we see 10% of the biomass degrade, just like we would expect to see in a landfill environment. Um, that would be quite disappointing, um, but you know, not catastrophic. So it's worth worth the risk. Okay, but uh, the engineers don't succeed doing anything better than when you don't try. Uh, that's right. <laughs> as an engineer, I can imagine that's a little disappointment. Um, and then in the best case would be that these larger scale projects, both of these projects are, are, are quite big in the scheme of things. Uh, these larger scale projects pave the way for smaller sort of distributed scale projects at the in forest level so that each forest in New Zealand can bury its own residue on site. A, a, a huge amount of our cost and carbon emissions are related to the collection and handling and transport of the feedstock. So if we can develop this methodology into something that is still rigorous but can be performed on a smaller scale, I think that would be great for um, yeah, scaling up the potential of this methodology. Okay, a distributed uh, solution uh, that would then eliminate the uh, handling and, and transport emissions. Uh, let, let's uh, finish here uh, for today. Uh, and um, uh, this is really um, exciting for us. There was a question whether uh, Puro is already uh, issuing these corks to woody biomass burial. No, we are not. Uh, we are uh, waiting for this methodology to be um, finalized, and then uh, uh, the projects need to do their evidence and their work. Uh, like said here, it's always exposed, so uh, there needs to be a data trail to be uh, verified by a third party before uh, cork, uh, corks can be issued. And um, thank you for joining today. Uh, lovely to see that there is interest and there is uh, expertise. Uh, thank you to our panelists, uh, Ruben, uh, Chris, uh, Simon and Leonard, of course. And uh, the recording and the feedback form uh, will be available in the uh, Pura Earth uh, webpage. So uh, please uh, give your feedback also there. Thank you. Thank everyone. you. Thank you Thanks on so. my behalf as well. Uh, this is Antti. Um, I just uh, wanted to uh, just say that um, if uh, there are some um, uh, people that are interested in um, buying these negative emissions uh, from these projects, uh, feel free to, to reach out to these gentlemen that have presented these projects here uh, directly or via uh, Puro. Of course, we are happy to help establish the, uh, the fit um, and uh, we are we, you can reach us by uh, sending an email to contact at pura.earth. And same goes for uh, projects or project developers that are thinking in these lines and see the opportunities. So please contact, uh, contact at pura.earth and uh, let's see what we can do together. All so right. thank you for today. Thank you all. Thank you.